Beyond Reason Radio. I mean, why do they... Why do they have to go after everything that I like? You know, things that I grew up with as a kid that I enjoyed. Why Why do they have to try to take that away from me, Tom Benson? No more peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, huh? Uh, that's probably coming. For some strange reason, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of one right now. Maybe because Peter Pan is white or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but an... <laughs> A film center decided to cancel an August 6th outdoor screening of the 1990 movie Kindergarten Cop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we used to have that on VHS. I used to watch it all the time when I was younger. It's a great movie. Uh I mean, it is what it is. Oh, wait, I'm not supposed to say that anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But it's the movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger is a cop and he's going after this really bad drug dealer Mm -hmm. and the only way to find out what's happening is to go undercover in a kindergarten class because the drug dealer's son Mm -hmm. is there and it's really to protect the son because they think he's going to go after the son the drug dealer i see okay and of course there's all kinds of hijinks because arnold schwarzenegger character is this stone cold cop that will he's big He's big, he's strong, he's tough. He doesn't he doesn't back down to anything. He you know. wants law. He and wants order. law in order and he has to deal with a bunch of kindergartners. So they're you know, it's funny. And he so he goes undercover and at first it's hard because the kids don't know what to do with him and he doesn't know what to do with the kids, so he puts law and order in the classroom and but, you know, eventually the kids love him, and he decides to teach full-time and falls in love with one of the teachers. Well, of course. You know, the and saves angle. the kid. and all. It's a great, it's a good movie. So who doesn't want this to uh, be out in circulation? So one person on Twitter. One. Because <laughs> this was going on in, in Oregon. One person complained on Twitter, and they decided to cancel it. Hmm. Because the tweet said this, what's so funny about the school to prison pipeline? Kindergarten cop out. Um, There's nothing fun in cops traumatizing kids. National reckoning on over policing is a weird time to revive kindergarten cop. We are trying to end the school to prison pipeline. There's nothing entertaining about the presence of police in schools, which feeds the school to prison pipeline, in which African American, American, Latinx, and other kids of color are criminalized rather than educated. Obviously, you haven't seen the movie. <laughs> That's not what the movie's about. The, the, it's just, uh, I mean, if you're going to complain about something, at least know. What you're complaining about. The 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 movie is has nothing to do with the school to prison pipeline and over policing and traumatizing kids in school. It, that, no, it was about going after a really bad guy and protecting the kid. And it's 30 years old, this movie. And it's 30, it's a good family movie. Oh no, 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 what? no. Why why do why must we ruin everything? You like, you gotta on. you gotta take that back and you have to apologize to I mean, somebody. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what this is really about? It's just because there's a cop in it. Mm-hmm. There's gonna be people like this. Now anything that shows a cop in a good light, you're gonna have radical leftists and idiots like this decide that it must be banned because we can never make cops look good. That's what this is. He obviously doesn't understand the point of the movie. <laughs> it doesn't get the movie. Uh, I, I doubt has ever seen the movie. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I am your host, Michael Yaffe, the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. We are on till 8 p.m. tonight here on News Radio WFLA Orlando. Um, you can also catch us on Facebook Live. This might be the last time you can catch us on Facebook Live for a few months here on what? Beyond Reason. Really? Yeah, it's a sad day. 
You know, I've been in the studio uh-huh. for almost 10 years now, Tom oh, Benson. That's right. We're moving, aren't we? And we're moving. Now, hmm. eventually, we're going to be in a new studio and all that, but they had to put us in this temporary thing. It's a clo- it's a closet. It's off the boss's ba- uh, office. Which, you know, yeah. uh, that's where they, for my office, they move me in the closets. <laughs> for my studio, they move, you know, whatever, fine. I get it. <laughs> but they yeah, uh, temporarily going to be in there. So I don't think we're going to be able to do Facebook Live in there. So hmm. all the people that listen, which is a bunch of people actually do, apparently, because I get people tell me that's all they listen. If you're listening... Watching on Facebook Live right now, you have to listen on the iHeartRadio app if you want to listen live. Search News Radio WFO Orlando on the iHeartRadio app or listen to the podcast, which I promote every show. By the way, the voice you hear in the control room right now is Mr. Tom Benton. How are you, Tom? I'm doing fine, and this new studio thing starts when? Tomorrow? Yep, tomorrow. Oh, mercy. So uh, I'll be back. We'll still be here doing the show. So we have a, a, a new set of buttons to learn how to push and turn on and off and all that yes, good it's, stuff? it's very difficult. I I have to talk to my union rep and see why we're being... Oh, wait, I don't have a union rep. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Shh. Shh. We don't talk about those things here. <laughs> so speaking of the whole issue with police, there's a great article in thehill.com. Uh, by Andrew Stein. Here, here's the title. Democrats' silence on our summer of violence is a tactical blunder. Mm-hmm. I think he's right about this. It, it really is somewhat amazing to me how the Democrats right now are basically trying to convince you that the violence that we saw this summer out of violent protests and other things, they're they're trying to convince you it doesn't exist. Like, it's not a real thing. It's quite amazing to watch this. Like, what happened in Portland, and Seattle, and Minneapolis, and all of these different things going on in the country. We saw, with our own eyes, this happening on a daily basis. Now, there were a lot of peaceful protests, but there was a lot of violence as well. We all saw it. And they're trying to convince us now. That it, it it's like didn't happen. It, it didn't. It doesn't exist. It's just conservatives trying to rile you up in all of this. Huh? Okay, you know you know what's going to happen next though. Eventually, they're not going to be able to ignore it, so they're just going to justify it. I mean, we've seen a little bit of that, but the the strategy right now is to pretend it's not happening. Eventually, they're just going to say, "Well, yeah, it's happening," but they're justified. Because cops are bad and, you know. It's the policies of this uh, Trump administration, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, all that nonsense. (laughs) So he writes here in the article, uh, quotes Joseph Welch, have you no decency, sir? That's the attorney who stood up to Joe McCarthy, the bullying um, Mm -hmm. senator during a 1954 Senate hearing. And once he said it, the nightmare that was McCarthyism was over. Who will Joseph Welch who makes us up from this new wave of reverse McCarthyism. Today you are blacklisted if you don't support a far-left agenda. It's true. Mm -hmm. He continues on, he says, It's time that a Democrat crossed the invisible picket line to condemn both the cancel culture and the mindless violence in our cities. It's time that a Democrat stood up for the First Amendment in this country and the need for an open political debate. And it's time that a Democrat exploded the nonsense that what is going on in Portland and Seattle is just protests and not destructive anti-police, anti-American violence that needs to be stopped, not coddled. He continues on here. He says, unfortunately, today's Joe Biden is not that Democrat. He's too concerned with courting left-wing voters to call out these destructive currents in America. This is why they're trying to ignore it, Mm -hmm. because they believe by acknowledging it, it will be more votes for Trump. They might be right on that, Mm -hmm. because it's not not conservatives that are doing this. It's not conservative Trump supporters that are causing all this violence. It's radical leftists who will most likely vote for Joe Biden against Trump. Um, Or not vote at all. Yeah, or, you know, writing Bernie Sanders or something, or Fidel Castro, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Biden is signing packs with Senator Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. 
He could be courageous and stand up for the country he is seeking to lead. And he could be, he could outline a program for ending the black on black crime that kills thousands of African American kids every year. He proudly supported the Clinton anti-crime bill back in the day when he was for law and order in this country. Back then, he believed in the effectiveness of tough measures to reduce crime and to save lives by taking violent criminals off the streets. Today, he is missing in action, MIA, when it comes to stopping the waves of violence sweeping our cities. Why has he not called out Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler for the outrageous position that it is the defenders of federal property who are to blame? And I've been asking this for weeks. It's not a hard position. Support law enforcement against those perpetrating violence in our cities. Shouldn't be that difficult to do, but for some reason it is. And you have um, basically media types like John Oliver try to say, well, yeah, there's some things going on there, but it's, it's really not that big a deal. It's just it's just Republicans trying to scare you. Nothing it's not to that big see a deal. here, just move and, along. And the police are just rounding up people and arresting them, and it's like uh, it's like an authoritarian dictatorship now or some, some stupid nonsense. Mm-hmm. This guy's exactly right here. He says House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is not that Democrat either. She is busy describing federal agents defending a courthouse as stormtroopers. Mm-hmm. And it's concerned about the constitutional rights of those committing violent acts. Polls show that 80% of Americans think things are out of control. And a majority of Americans want to see those who commit acts of violence prosecuted. There is a national consensus that violence is rising as a result of the protests that are undermining the rule of law in the country. And it really is undermining the rule of law. By allowing this to continue on and basically caving in, what they're doing is they're actually caving into it. That's the worst part of it. And we're going to talk in a little bit about what's going on in Seattle, how they, the city council wants to vote to largely defund the police and the mayor and uh, the police chief there are trying to fight back. They're undermining the rule of law, and they're caving in. So the protests are not going to stop. They might stop for a while, but they're going to come back because now they know that this kind of thing is effective. So they're going to continue to do it. He says here, and Representative Jared Nadler, fresh from his impeachment run, is certainly not going to condemn violence that he dismissed as a myth. He has perpetrated perpetrated uh, support for attacks on federal property, And it is those attacks that endanger federal law enforcement officials who are simply trying to do their jobs. It's not clear that the government puts up a fence and that the violent offenders try to tear down the fence and launch fireworks and deploy destructive lasers against federal officers. It's pretty clear. An AP reporter, which I read on this show, went in to the federal building and reported on the violence that was going on and how those U.S. Marshals were in. They were afraid for their lives every time they left the building. Because of what was going on. Oh, but it's, you know, there's just, it's just really a spray paint. That's all that's really going on. It's just a little bit of vandalism, you know, not a big deal. Uh Uh-huh. It's no different when it comes to the cancel culture. Not a major single Democrat has stood up and roundly condemned the idea that people should be fired or lose their tenure just for questioning the Black Lives Matter organization, despite making clear that they are not questioning racial justice or equality. In the rush to take advantage of every action that hurts Trump, these Democrats make the mistake that the views of the elite left are similar to the members of their own party. So far, the person who came closest to speaking out and who is not a Republican or a conservative is journalist Barry Weiss. She effectively exposed and denounced the culture at the New York Times. He continues on here, though. He says... Even as a political strategy, the silence by Democrats on these issues is a huge tactical mistake, creating the potential of a backlash for so clearly trying to deny obvious reality. This is why I've been saying for weeks now, they're trying to deny what is obvious. We see it with our eyes. We hear it with our ears. We know exactly what's going on. And they're like, it's not there. (laughs) You know, these are not the droids you're looking for. Mm Mm-hmm. I guess they are. I guess the Democrats really are the dark side. So maybe that is what's going on there. Um, It says joining together with Republicans against violence in defense of the First Amendment is a far smarter position because these radicals who are fomenting violence won't really be supporting any party. These are not election issues. They are basic American issues. And Attorney General William Barr was entirely right 
in his testimony last week before Congress that one of our political parties should never turn a blind eye towards violence against our nation. It has been this way for more than 200 years since the Whiskey Rebellion. Because destruction of federal property, like our courthouses, is not an action one against one party, but an action against all parties. By the way, this is written by Andrew Stein. He is the former Democratic president of the New York City Council and former and founder and chairman of Democrats for Trump. Hmm. So he's a Democrat. How about that? Who's got, who got sick of his party yeah. because they've, they've gone radical. We have to talk more about this, and some are pushing back against this which is a good thing. And we'll talk about how that's going on and much more. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I am your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. Subscribe to the Beyond Reason podcast today on your Stitcher app and hear the voice of reason anytime. Your safe space for conservative thought, not for political correctness. Yaffe is back right now. Yes, welcome back to the show. This is Beyond Reason Radio, the show where we talk faith, culture, and politics. We're on till 8 p.m. tonight here on News Radio WFLA Orlando. But first, we have to get back to what's gone on in cities like Seattle. The good news is some people are fighting back, including the police chief of Seattle, who um, does a really good job. Um, and, and what's really good about her is uh, she is she just comes off as very reasonable. But her name is Cameron Best. I want to play a little bit of what she said um, at a press conference today because the city council is va- in Seattle has basically voted to defund a lot of the police in that city. And obviously, that's not a good thing. Obviously, they don't have a real plan. And obviously, the police chief is fighting back. Here's what she said. Overall, there are some good approaches in the proposals. Some of the ideas SPD already had and has raised before. But what is problematic is these are approaches without any clarity on how they will become reality. What is the plan? The push from council and some of our community is to do these large-scale changes in 2020 with no practical plan for community safety. And I believe wholeheartedly that is completely reckless. Plan for community safety. Don't you understand, Chief Best? Once we get rid of the police and have more government social programs, everything will just be safe. We won't need the police anymore because it'll just be a utopia. Because the only reason crime exists in the first place, Cameron Best, is because of the evil capitalist system. That has inequalities and makes people criminals in this evil American society. Get with the program, Cameron Best. Jeez. (laughs) I mean, obviously, she's a good voice of reason. You know, she wrote a letter recently as well to the city council talking about a personal experience she had. Protesters actually tried to go to her house. This This is a new thing where they feel like they have to disrupt you in your home to get their message across, which is... Really not a good sign, but she writes in a letter, Dear um, President Gonzalez, Chairman Woman Herbold, and Seattle City Council members, uh, I wanted to update you on recent events, particularly those that occurred last night. A, re- a resident of mine was targeted by a large group of aggressive pro- protesters late last night. My neighbors were concerned by such a large group but they were successful in ensuring the crowd was not able to trespass or engage in other illegal behavior in the area, despite repeated attempts to do so. Yeah, this isn't really happening. It's a figment of your imagination. Don't forget that. Currently, the local sheriff is monitoring the situation. I urge both of you and the entire city council to stand up for what is right. They're they're not going to, Chief Bess. It's not going to happen. These direct actions against elected officials and especially civil servants like myself are out of line and go against every democratic principle that guides our nation. Before this devolves into a new way of doing business by mob rule here in Seattle and across the nation, elected officials like you must forcefully call for the end of these tactics. Similar to what I read at the beginning of the show, none of this is going to change until people on that side start to really stand up against this but Mm -hmm. they're not 
Mm -hmm. They're they're doing the opposite. They're placating it. it. Says the events of this summer were initiated in a moment of grief and outrage over the murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers and so many other black and brown people suffering at the hands of injustice. So she even admits that she agrees with part of the Black Lives Matter movement. All of us must ensure that this righteous cause is not lost in the confusion of so many protesters now engaging in violence and intimidation, which many are not speaking against. By the way, this just shows you how crazy all of this is. She's black. She herself is black. And she admits that there are problems with policing and even sympathizes with the Black Lives Matter community. And yet it's mostly young white protesters who are protesting against her. This is how backwards all of this really, really is. Um, I want to move on to the stimulus thing because Democrats and Republicans are still arguing over what's going on with the stimulus package. And... One of the biggest arguments is something we've talked about on this show before. It has to do with the fact that Republicans don't want to keep giving people more money for being unemployed. So they don't go back to work. Yeah, so they don't go back to work. Now, do you have the McConnell cut? I I don't know if that was the next cut, but go ahead and play what he said today, because I thought he actually made a really good point. Senate Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell. We just don't think it's remotely fair for the federal government to tax essential workers who kept working every day so Uncle Sam can pay their neighbors a higher salary to stay home. I mean, isn't this just common sense? And that's actually an angle I didn't really think about. Because you have basically workers who are essential, some of them risking their lives working in the pandemic, who are getting paid less than people who are staying home and just getting checks from the government. How does that make sense? But there are some out there that are trying to convince us that, no, 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 we need to keep paying them. Even though this is the perfect example of how socialist experiments fail. This is the perfect, for years, conservatives have said the problem with a lot of these socialist programs is it encourages bad behavior or it encourages people not to work and that eventually hurts the economy. No, 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 no. You're just not compassionate. We need to send out as many programs and help these people. You're just not compassionate. And then it happens. They do something like this. And what's happening? People don't want to go back to work because they make more on unemployment. And now the Democrats are saying, no, it's that's not it. They want to go back to work. It's just um, they're scared. They're scared of the virus. So they're staying home. But they really want to go back to work wrong that that's incorrect that's wrong business owners across the country have tried to get people to go back to work and they won't why would they they don't want to they make more on unemployment by the way i i know someone i'm close to someone who works in a certain industry sales for a certain industry Mm -hmm. not radio by the way Mm -hmm. but sales for a certain industry and he talks to small business owners in that industry Uh lots of them sure He told me several of them are having to basically secretly pay people under the table to work. Wow. Because they won't come back because they're making more on unemployment. So they don't want to come back. As long as those unemployment checks come in, they have no incentive to come back. So the only way to get them to come back is to secretly pay them under the table so those people can get the unemployment checks still and make a little bit more under the table. Isn't that something? And that's actually what's going on. Hmm. He said he's talked to several business owners who have this issue where they can't get their employees to come back because they're making more on unemployment. So they're trying to convince you it's not a real thing. But we we all know it's a real thing. I mean, the Wall Street Journal editorial board had an article about how um, Yale economists said that the $600 federal enhancement to jobless benefits hasn't affected the incentive to work. Of course, they offered limited evidence but of course it's going to affect the incentive to work but another issue that has come up when it comes to um the coronavirus stimulus package has to do with the liability so republicans smartly don't want businesses to be completely liable if one of their employees or one of their customers end up catching the virus and this is a good point because how for one how do you prove 
that your employee actually caught it at work. There, there's no way to prove that or that your customer actually caught it in the store. You can't prove that. But there are already lawsuits starting and have been going on for the past couple of months from people because they had they caught the virus and they blame their employer. Um, story right here. Um, a widow of someone who died from the virus uh-huh. is suing the grocery store Safeway uh-huh. for wrongful death of her husband after the virus outbreak. Um, Pedra was his name. 52 was a longtime employee of the Purdue's division of Safeway's distribution center in Tracy. Um, that I believe, what city, what state is Tracy in? It had it here, and then I don't, I don't have it now. Um, I'll have to look that up. But apparently, uh, he caught the virus and unfortunately died from the virus. A really tragic story. But she is now suing them because saying that they didn't do enough to prevent him from getting the virus. Now, this was like early on in the pandemic. So they were doing probably everything they could and knew how to do. There was a lot of confusion at the time. But for one, this shows the biggest problem with the litigation obsession in this society. Because we have to blame someone. You know, the Democrats are blaming the virus on Trump. Trump's blaming the virus on China. And now we're going to blame people who catch the virus on the business. Then, you know... People are blaming DeSantis for it here in Florida. We always were just constantly pointing fingers. Maybe it's just a tragic situation that was mostly out of your control. I guarantee you that Safeway, the grocery store, doesn't want their employees to die from the virus. I guarantee you they don't want that. They don't like that. They want to take care of their employees. And probably did the best they could to take care of their employees. But if we don't have some kind of liability protection against these businesses, you are going to see lawsuits all over the place. Absolutely. And how can you prove he got it at the store? He could have got it. You can't. You can't prove he got it at the store. You can't prove that Safeway was, I mean, unless they were purposefully negligent, not even trying to do anything. But at the time, so one of the complaints is that they didn't encourage people at the time to wear masks. But why didn't they encourage people at the time to wear masks? Because the CDC at the time said, do not wear masks. And the Surgeon General at the time said, do not wear masks. This was the beginning. There's a lot of people that just didn't know how to react at the beginning of this virus. They didn't know what was best. They did the best they could with the, with the supplies they could. What do you want Safeway to do? Just shut down so nobody can get food? But this this is the thing. Instead of just saying, wow, this is a real tragic death in the midst of a tragic situation in this country, that's not good enough. We have to blame the company and we have to sue them and try to get money out of them because it's somehow their fault. Maybe it's nobody's fault. Maybe it just happened and it's tragic. But this is what we do in our society. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, there's a great uh, Babylon B thing. The satire site Babylon B about it says a complete breakdown of the trillion dollar stimulus bill. And then it says entertainment part of it, you know, entertainment, a giant trampoline for white house lawn, ice cream for Pelosi. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably uh, the best uh, breakdown I've seen of it. Uh, anyway, you should check it out. Maybe I'll re I re- just retweeted it on my Twitter at Michael Yaffe. By the way, Speaking of something that's almost a parody, Joe Biden's still running for president. Uh, He (laughs) is? uh, Apparently. That's what he says. (laughs) I am? (laughs) uh, Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, But there's there's a debate over whether he will debate President Trump. You know, they'll have the presidential debates. So we got to talk about that and much more. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. If you miss any of the show, you can download the Beyond Reason podcast on iTunes. The place where we talk faith, culture, and politics. Beyond Reason Radio continues. So I believe that Joe Biden, former Vice President Joe Biden, 
is running for president still, right? That as, is a thing. As of Showtime, yes. Okay. I'm just double checking because I wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> it's there. There has been a debate going on on whether he should actually debate President Trump. Now, Trump, you know, to give him credit, wants to move up the debates, believe it or not. He wants to have another debate and have it earlier. That's because he wants to influence the polls. Well, he wants to influence the polls, but he realizes that there's a lot of early voting now. Oh, that's right. So people are already going to start to vote soon, and he can move up the debate. And he thinks that debating Biden will be a benefit to him, and he's probably right. But what's really interesting is as this debate is going on, um, it was Brian Stelter of CNN, and I, I had it here. Brian Stelter of CNN basically said this is something that's just being ginned up by uh, conservatives. Mm-hmm. The idea of him not debating. That, oh, you know, it was just, uh, he actually put out a tweet on this. Let me grab the tweet. He said, it's mostly a right-wing media tempest fueled by hour after hour of Fox commentary, not reporting, far removed from campaign reality. You know, this whole idea of Biden not debating. Mm-hmm. And, of course, all these people pointed out that all the people that were saying that Biden shouldn't debate were Democrats. <laughs> it started with Tom Friedman of the New York Times saying that he shouldn't ba- debate Trump. Because they should have fact checkers and all that. And people are just pointing out all of these different things from left-wing outlets saying that Biden should not debate Trump. And Brian Stelter still is saying, um, no, 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 no. This is mostly right-wing. And he says, I'm well aware, but it's a mistake to spend lots of precious time yakking about what lefty columnists are suggesting in this case. Oh, now he admits it's lefty columnists suggesting this. I mean, come on. But I think there's actually some truth to this because Biden wants this election to be about Trump. If you make this election about Joe Biden, it's not going to go well for him. He doesn't want any attention towards himself. He wants to make this a referendum on Trump. Because when you hear and listen to Joe Biden, um, he's obviously not all there. It's I, I, hate, I hate to, you know, I, I thought about making this a Yaffy Laffy. But I hate to do that because it's kind of sad, you know, what he's going through. It's, it, you know, we laugh about it a little bit, but part of it, it's kind, it's kind of tragic. Oh, he sure. obviously is starting dementia or he's just getting older and it's, it's not good. It happens. Um, but here, here's an example of him in a recent interview, just trying to talk about China and the WHO and nobody knows what he's talking about. Here it is. And this is not edited by us. Yeah, this is not edited at all. The way Trump, the way China will respond is when we gather the rest of the world that, in fact, invades in, in, free, in, in, in open trade and making sure that we're in a position that the world, uh, that, that we deal with WHO the right way, that, that, in fact, that's when things begin to change. That's when China, that's when uh, China's behavior is going to change. What? <laughs> but it gets even worse. So Biden was asked if he took the same cognitive test as Trump, because Trump always promotes this thing for some dumb reason. And his response is quite a minute. This is why they don't want him to debate. Here it is. Have you taken a cognitive no, test? No, I haven't taken a test. Why the hell would I take a test? Come on, man. That's like saying you, before you got in this program, if you take a test where you're taking cocaine or not, what do you think, huh? Are you a junkie? What do you say to President Trump, who brags about his test and makes your mental state an issue for voters? Well, if he can't figure out the difference between an elephant and a lion, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Did you watch that? Look, come on, man. I, I, I know you're trying to goad me, but I mean, I'm so forward looking to have an opportunity to sit with the president or stand with the president in debates. There can be plenty of time. And by the way, as I joke with him, you know, it, I, I shouldn't say it. I'm going to say something I don't I, I probably shouldn't say. Or for anyway, God. I am uh, I am very willing to let the American public judge my physical and mental fil- my physical <laughs> as well as my mental um, fil- fitness. It's just it's hard to listen it, to. It is kind of sad. And 
first he he tells a black reporter, you know, it'd be like me asking you for a cocaine test. Then he says, oh, I'd, I'd love to debate. And then he like forgets what he's going to say. And then he tries to say, I'm willing to let the American people judge my mental fitness and can't even complete the sentence. Trust me, the Democrats really don't want him to, be, to debate, but I, I don't know if they're going to have any choice. I, I think right now, most Americans still expect presidential candidates to debate, and it would be very, very difficult for Biden to back out of that without making himself look bad. But he wants to make this election about Trump. This is why he hides in his basement, not because of the virus, but because it helps him. It helps him just to stay quiet. And every time he comes out, it's just not good. So appreciate you listening to the show. If you missed any of it, check the podcast on the iHeartRadio app. And I'll be back tomorrow at the same time. See you guys then.